This UCSD TV program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest programs. Also, make sure to check out and subscribe to our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, available only on YouTube. Thank you for joining us for this evening's Exploring Ethics program at the Reuben H. Fleet Science Center. I am Mike Kalichman. I'm director for the Center for Ethics in Science and Technology, and also director for the Research Ethics Program at UC San Diego. Uh, for those of you who haven't been to our programs before and aren't familiar with our model, the Ethics Center is not interested in simply talking to you. The purpose of these programs is to generate conversations where we can work together with you in identifying the ethical challenges that go with science and technology, as well as identifying possible or articulating possible solutions to those challenges. This evening's program is the first in a new series we're doing on a book that was written and published 50 years ago this year. In 1962, Silent Spring was published by Rachel Carson. Um, the book ended up being, for many, the beginning of what we now know and take for granted as the environmental movement. The book um, has many features, those of you who haven't read it recently or haven't yet read it, which um, recommend it highly for the series we have in mind. One is that it is highly readable. The second is that despite the fact that it was written 50 years ago, it remains highly relevant to the world we live in. And finally, in the relevance is not just that it seems topical, even though it's written 50 years ago, but the issues that are raised are ones that we are still talking about in significant ways, and, and that's what we hope to address in a number of different dimensions during this series. The series as a whole is a collaboration. This is not just UC San Diego, where I'm from, but it involves many other institutions, including California State University San Marcos, Grossmont College, Point Loma Nazarene University, University of San Diego, San Diego State University, um, uh, and, and as I mentioned, the um, UC San Diego where I am, as well as the Fleet Science Center, which has been hosting our programs here for many years now. Uh, we started here in May 2008. This will be our 52nd program at the Fleet Science Center. To moderate this evening's program, I've asked Stan Malloy of San Diego State University to take the lead. That's because San Diego State University is the lead underwriter of tonight's program, in part. Um, some of you may have seen Stan before. He's been part of some of our programs earlier. He's a professor of microbiology, also a dean for the, uh, the dean for College of Sciences at San Diego State. So please welcome me in joining Stan, who will introduce this evening's speaker and moderate tonight's program. I think we're in for a really fun evening today. The, the speaker tonight is Steve Welter, and Steve is going to be talking about pesticides and insects. He's a real expert on insects. He did his bachelor's degree at UC Davis in entomology, and he got a PhD at UC Riverside in entomology. So not only is he an expert on insects, but he's an expert on California. And he went on, he was a professor for many years, at UC Berkeley, where he did research on plant-insect interactions, this very interface where pesticides are so important. And he is also involved in the development of new types of approaches, new types of biocontrol mechanisms to supplant incest pesticides that cause problems. So over his career, He's worked a lot on the very topic that we're going to discuss tonight, and a very topic that was a fundamental key issue in Silent Spring. In addition to doing a lot of research on these areas, for many years he taught a course in environmental sciences where he got the students to focus on what the ethical issues are, to realize 
that it's not all black and white, that there are a lot of issues that you have to think of where if you're helping one person, you may be harming another person. And I think that that's a really important topic for us to think about to maintain the focus on ethics tonight. Before I turn this over to him, I'd like to read you a quote from Rachel Carson. This is from chapter two of Silent Spring. These sprays, dust, and aerosols are now applied almost universally to farms, gardens, forests, and homes. Non-selective chemicals that have the power to kill every insect, the good and the bad, to still the song of birds and the leaping of fish in the streams, to coat the leaves with a deadly film that will linger on in soil. All this, though the intended target may be only a few weeds or insects. Now, if you take that at its face value, you would say, what we should do is just get rid of pesticides. But there's another half of the story that Steve's going to talk to us about tonight that is really an important part of this ethical dilemma. So I welcome Steve Welter to talk to you tonight. Thank you, Stanley, and uh, thank you to the Center for inviting me. Um, it's usually pretty fun to talk to the public, to be honest, about this kind of thing. Um, as Stanley mentioned, I'm, I'm really a field ecologist, and, and normally I would admit this in a party, but I am also an entomologist. Um, so what we're going to try to talk about today is um, insecticides, sort of, sort of the dilemma that they, they pose for us, uh, maybe some of the reasons why we're using them, uh, maybe some of the reasons less so why we shouldn't use them, because I think people know that already. And then maybe ultimately we'll finish with um, maybe some alternatives that actually seem to work these days. Um, what's nice about this symposium is that it's really centered around Rachel Carson. And she's got just a phenomenal story for those who haven't had a chance to read her life. But it's, there's a book called The Age of Environmentalism that does a very nice treatment of her. And the thing I used to like about talking about her was that she's really not a very flashy person. And in fact, most of her writing was, was uh, about things like the oceans beforehand. And she didn't do a lot of environmental activism. So in 1957, you know, she starts to, to write this thing as a series, and they make it into a book. Um, at the same time, her own personal life was sort of crumbling. Her mother dies. Her sister um, dies. She ends up having to take on a, a young lad with her. Um, and then in 1960, she's diagnosed with breast cancer. So she knows that she's going to die. So ultimately, Silent Spring comes out in the early 60s. And here you have a woman who is very quiet. Um, uh, and at the same time, stepping up in a very significant way and ultimately um, gets all kind of grief. So let me read you not so much a quote from her, but from someone else who was referring to her. Because at the time, she was under tremendous attack. She was called a communist. I think um, these days we'd call her a socialist. That seems to be more popular. Um, but in the end, that, that in the end they, they viewed her as a member of a cult. So let me, let me read what something named Paul Brooks wrote which is the editor of Silent Spring, and he also was her biographer. And I said, her opponents must have realized, as indeed was the case, that she was questioning not only the indiscriminate use of poisons, but the basic irresponsible of a, irresponsibility of an industrialized technological society towards the natural world. She refused to accept the premise that damage to nature was the inevitable cost of progress. The, the facts that she revealed were bad enough, but it was a point of view behind them that was really dangerous, and it had to be suppressed. So you can almost take a lot of different environmental issues today and sort of say, are we hearing the same kind of thing? That, that envir you know, environmentalism has been painted as an obstructionist perspective. It's the people who go and hug snail darters at the expense of everyone else. Right? They weave their clothes out of grass they grew in their backyard. You know, all this sort of villainization of an approach when really what people are saying is, you know, maybe we can do a little bit better job. Maybe we need to look a little bit harder at how we approach things. And so that's kind of the things we're going to do today is talk about our food. Um, now, one of the things that we'll find probably throughout today is that it's all about trade-offs, right? So we all want to, for instance, I want to be thinner, but I want to be able to eat everything I want, right? Um, <laughs> I'd like to have a clarity of vision when I was young, but I find the older I get, my eyes get a little bit uh, more smoky. Um, I want to be young again, but I don't want to lose my experience. So every one of these things seems to give you a dilemma 
where you want something, but there's a price. And are we prepared to pay the price? And the same thing is going to be true with our food. And insecticides are part of our current agricultural system. It is built into the system. It is an assumption of the system. And ultimately, one of the questions we're going to ask, I hope today, is who's responsible for the use of the insecticides? How, how moral can we be? How big can our finger wag at somebody else at the end of the day? So we look at agriculture uh, up in the slide here, and we may think of agriculture as you know, the sort of little thin, reedy guy pulling the corn out of his field. But that's not the way agriculture really looks anymore today. Agriculture, in some places, looks exactly like this, because you do have small farmers. But it also is a very much a large corporate organization as well sometimes. And I think both are fabulous. I'll tell you right now, I'm a big fan of agriculture. I'm a fan of my agricultural people I've worked with over the years. But I also recognize that they're caught in a dilemma of trying to produce things that we want in a way that's economic in a world global economy that makes it pretty tough. So the question ultimately is this, or there's a series of questions. What do we want from our food? So for instance, how many of you want organic food? Could you raise your hand? Right. So what's the definition of organic? <clears throat> I once heard someone say, people who spray at night. Is that? <laughs> OK, m maybe not. But, but in the end, what does organic mean? So organic means, so normally the way we do this kind of talk was we would have a conversation. I'd ask you to respond on the fly. The problem is we're recording it, and so your answers wouldn't get picked up. So I'm going to fill in your answers for you, and sometimes you'll be wrong. Um, <laughs> so organic basically has a lot of different um, attributes. It depends on who's doing the certification. There's a big fight over GMOs or non-GMOs. But basically what it comes down to is that things that are natural in origin can be included in organic agriculture. Things that are not synthetic are not incorporated. Now the question is, is it safer? So for instance, something that would have fit the bill for organic was it would have been nicotine. So nicotine used to be sold as a product called Black Leaf 40. Most people wouldn't be thrilled if their products were sprayed with nicotine now. But that's also an organic in nature. And then there's other products that are um, synthetic that, as far as we know, are extremely safe. So then what is it we're trying to accomplish? Now, sometimes when I talk to my friends, because I do deal with a lot with organic growers as well, is that there's sometimes someone eventually will say, you know what, it's more than just synthetic and non-synthetic. It's really a philosophy. And there are people who, are, who buy organic and say, I don't like what they call corporate organic. So then it turns out it's more, more complicated than just a kind of food. It turns out it's, a, it's almost a lifestyle. So the question is, do we want organic or inorganic? Maybe we want organic. Do we want low input or high input? Well, we'll vote low input, right? Um, do we want it locally grown? Well, maybe we want How many want it locally grown? That's got to be better. Well, do we want it locally grown if, in fact, the place you live is not a good place to grow the crop? <laughs> or, or do you only get to eat the things that are near you, and you live in Vegas, <laughs> right? So you can eat chips. Um, in California, we could do it. Now, I also have heard an argument made that in New Zealand, for instance, they have phenomenal apple yields. And they've penciled out the energetics of it. And they've said, we can grow apples better and cheaper energetically, even if we transport them, than you can do it in your countries, because we're better at it. So then you say, well, wait a minute. Locally grown is better. But, but is it better? So that's something else we have to think. And then the question is, do we want small farms? And, and the answer might be yes, because we believe in the value of small farms. But now you're coming into something that's a lot smokier to measure, and who gets to agree if it's small farms or, or not? So th those are four things. You say, well, wait a minute. What we really want to do is none of those things. What we want to do is feed the world. We have an obligation to feed the world. There are at least a billion people that are currently hungry. Do we have an obligation to feed the world? Maybe we don't. But if you do, are you going to do it from grandpa's cornfield that you had there, loading them in the back of the pickup and driving them overseas, right? So then that's one question. Do you have to have cheap food? America has a cheap food policy. You pay about 6.5% for your food. And there's rough numbers. This is USDA numbers. Europe pays maybe a little, more than, a little less than twice, but it's approaching that, um, which isn't too bad. But they clearly are paying more for their food than we are. And if you go to places in Africa, typically, or other countries, Belarus, you're going to be paying about 40% of your income for food. So America has a cheap food policy. We built an agricultural system that says, we believe that food should be accessible. Now, let me add a wrinkle. I told you that that's 6.5% on average for the US, which is true, unless you're poor. 
So people who are poor here, they pay up to sometimes 50% of their income for food. So as we talk about things that might change the price of food, should we also think about changing the way we support people who need food? And maybe the answer is yeah. But it's, it, just recognize that as we inflate the price of food, we may inflate the pain differentially. Truthfully, if you double my food bill, it doesn't change my life that much. If it doubled your food bill, my guess is it wouldn't change your life that much either. But you double someone else's food bill, and it's a big problem. Do you want safe food? How many people are worried about food safety? Well, you hear about all those issues, you know, with different kinds of bacterial contamination. Is that important to you? So that's something to think about because there's a lot of regulations that are flowing, are flowing these down days from safer kinds of foods. Do you want food security? Safe food, so food security at a national and international scale. We are the breadbasket of a lot of countries. We grow massive amounts of food. We control our food supply. We can globalize our food supply, probably cheaper. But do we care if we control our food? So there's another dilemma. And do you want stable food prices? So food prices have floated over the, over the years. Now, let me add a couple other things. Now maybe, not, maybe that's none of the things you really want. What you really want is you've, you've done your science and you've said, look, I've looked at the environmental impact and the way they've produced high foods is because they put so many inputs. I want, I want a low nitrogen system. I'm tired of the dead zone out in the Gulf of Mexico. I don't want runoffs coming off these farms. I can't afford the water use because agriculture takes a tremendous amount of water. So we don't really want high water use. Again, we want to be low cost. Maybe we're worried about the energetics of agriculture. So have we, hit, have we hit your topic yet? So, so energetic, so the reason agriculture is so productive is in part we've substituted human labor for um, mechanical labor, we've, through gasoline. The energy comes from somewhere, right? There's no free lunches in the world, except unless you're a politician. Um, you know, so there's no free lunches, and the energy that comes from somewhere, in this case, comes from fossil fuels. And then you have issues of sustainable land use. And finally, you don't want any of those things. What you really want is a system of social justice. And you want fair wages. And you want self-sufficiency within a country. And you want to provide a stable income. And food security for us as well as others. So I've run through four or five slides. Um, and can we get them all? So if we were to go back to you and we were to say, which is the most important, would this room agree? My guess is no. And, and, and the answer would say, oh, I, I want them all. Well, we all want them all. But it's going to find there's going to be conflicts. And that's ultimately the decisions we make. Now, what I'm going to actually pose to you now is the reason we have our agriculture the way it is is because of you. Not because of you as individuals, but you as a collective. Our society demands, demands insecticide use. And I'll explain to you why I think that's true. And then you can decide if we want to demand that insecticide use or do we want to step away from it? And if we step away from it, what price are we willing to pay? Okay. So here's the five questions I'm going to, I'm going to try to, I'm going to throw out for you, something for you guys to think about. We'll hit some of them. What do we want from our agriculture we already talked about? Who gets to make those decisions? I don't know who gets to make them. I know someone does. It's not me. But apparently, they're made. How do we make decisions? And should we use cost risk benefit models? And then finally, who's responsible for these decisions? Should we use pesticides? Or even more importantly, why do we use pesticides? Because I can tell you there's a lot of good reasons why we use pesticides. They all come at a price, but there's a lot of good reasons. And if not insecticides, then what? Can you just say, I don't like it? Or do you have to say, I've got an alternative, and I'm going to substitute it in? So let me give you like three or four minutes of some stats that might be interesting to you. So most people are not familiar with agriculture anymore. And so the story, so the joke is sort of, why do we even need agriculture when we have such good supermarkets, right? <laughs> so the question is, how many of the people in the room here are affiliated with agriculture? If you could raise your hand. So one, two, three. And, and the tech question is ultimately is how do you find it? It turns out that's about the right percent. If there's 100 people in this room, it turns out it's about 2 to 3% of the people are affiliated with agriculture. The old days, whatever that is, in the 1800s, it would have been maybe 60, 70, or more percent. So people are much more distanced from their food. Somehow it, it appears on the shelves. We don't really see the process. And yet, at the same time, we're at being asked to make decisions. Food has gone, become so productive per acre. 
it is just blisteringly good how far it is. So let me give you a couple numbers and then I'll leave the numbers alone. So from 1950 to 1957 to 1997, the number of farms declined in the US from five and a half million to about 1.9 million. We've lost farms, right? As we lose farms, what does that mean? The acreage isn't changing really. It means the farms have gotten bigger. At the same time, farm production increased from one farmer supporting the needs of 15 people in 1950 to now one farmer supports the needs of almost 140 people. So you've had tenfold increase for what that farmer is producing. Our yields have gone through the roof. Fivefold increases in, in wheat and, and big increases in corn, soybean, whatever. And they've done it somehow, but it's not magic. They've done it because they've put things into cropping systems to get that incredible yield nitrogen, water, energy, um, tillage, and so forth. And they've changed the very nature of the plant. And we're about to change the nature of those plants even greater with genetically modified approaches. And, and we can talk about that. I'm not a molecular biologist. I have opinions. Um, I'll tell you up front, I'm actually pretty much on board, which may upset some of you. But it's the kind of thing I think we can talk about as to why we may or may not be. Labor has gone down tremendously in farming, but I'm not going to go through those numbers there. So let me see what I got going here. So let me tell you why I think pesticides are required by our system now, and then we'll get uh, onto some of the other questions. We demand perfect produce. And let me give you an example of that. I worked on pears. I'll show you some stuff on pears. Pears, as it turns out, have a little tiny mite that has a very thin little mouth part and it stings the cells on the skin of the pear and it turns them brown. What color is a Bartlett pear supposed to be? Green. Green. So what do we do? We spray pesticides, an insect, and a miticide actually, to kill those mites so that it's, the green skin doesn't turn brown. Now, a bosk pear is supposed to be what? Brown. If a bosk pear doesn't turn brown enough, what do we do? We spray with copper to burn it to make it brown. So in the end of the day, I understand that. And the same thing is true for citrus with oranges. There's a little one that makes citrus uh, turn brown as well. I understand that. I emotionally accept it. I reach for the brown orange as best I can. When I go to the checkout stand, I find I've got orange oranges. And the reason why is because the oranges are not called browns, right? They look so much better so that intellectually I get it. But in the end of the day, it's very, very hard to pick the non-cosmetically beautiful fruit. We want to have risk avoidance as a, as a grower. It's like an insurance policy. Pesticides are like an insurance policy. I can tell you, we were, I'll show you a project, maybe I won't, um, where we basically had almost $10 million worth of pears at risk. I was in charge of the program. The only insurance we had was an 82 Honda Civic. I didn't sleep a lot that year. So it, 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 when you get your, your livelihood determined by getting that crop to market, all of a sudden an insecticide spray doesn't cost you very much, and yet at the same time, um, it's easy to put on, so why don't you do it? The other thing that happens is, they got to store them all year now, and the other thing that happens is if you try to ship internationally and you have any kind of problems, they'll get your load rejected, so you've got to be able to store them for long times, and oftentimes you get into quarantine problems with insects, and they require, in fact, they're mandated sometimes to spray for quarantined insects. So there's a lot of reasons why you did it. And, and the other thing is, they're inexpensive. They really are, relatively inexpensive. So if you want cheap food, you better have a system. So I'm going to show you some quick slides of one alternative to pesticides, and then hopefully that'll kickstart our conversation. I'm going to work with the worm in the apple. It's called codling moth. I've spent too many years working on this rascal. Um, it's, in, it's, it's a little disgusting in that what it does is it drills down through the fruit. It likes to eat the seeds. It shares with you on the way through that seed and leaves um, a trail. And as a consequence, most people are not thrilled with eating that apple. It, it turns out that it also, at the time we were working with, had some of the most acutely toxic insecticides used. And at the same time, they had resistance. So we had these growers come together and they said, we need something different because we know that they're going to regulate us. They're going to take away our right to use these insecticides. So what can we do different? Well, it turns out that there's things called pheromones. And I'm not sure if this has it. Yeah. So let's see if this works. Um, Poor insects are relatively rigid in their behaviors. If you give them the right cue, they will respond. And in this case, it's a chemical cue. So this poor male here 
the sex pheromones in the end of that test tube. He's flying up. He's convinced romance is going to be his that night. Instead, he finds a piece of glass. But he's just about as happy anyway because he's getting the cue um, that uh, it could be any minute. Now, the advantages of pheromones, there's no residue on the fruit. There um, is uh, no non-target effects on bees or anything else. It only works for this one species of codly moth, it's called. Other moths won't respond to it. Other insects won't respond. We don't smell it. Actually, you can smell it. Once I accidentally sprayed myself with this canister, it was the only time in my life I've been sexually attractive, apparently. Um, <laughs> just to the wrong species, but uh, you know, you, you gotta, you gotta take it where you can. Um, there's no farm worker safety issues unless they rub their eyes directly. It has a lot of logistic benefits to it. It has political advantages as far as the regulators. So how does this work? Normally the way it works is a, a male and a female find each other where the female will produce the sex pheromone, the male flies upwind, they fall in love and get married, and, um, and then proceed to have offspring. Now the idea was this, is that could you in fact tie a bunch of artificial sources of this pheromone so that instead of finding a female, he finds a little piece of plastic rope. And there's a, there's a lot of different mechanisms. We won't go into why that's happening. But this overall process is called something that called the male confusion technique, which I know a lot of you are saying, been there. Um, <laughs> and what happens then is, is that if you can't find the female, then you're not going to reproduce. And if you can't reproduce, then obviously you don't have a problem. So the idea is, could we, could we live out a PTA's dream and, and blanket an area with pheromones so that no, one, no male can find the females and ultimately, we just stop uh, sexual reproduction in an area. This is just a picture of one of the release devices. There are so many different ways to do it now. In fact, we can spray it. We can mist it. We can fly it on. We can do all kinds of ways. The idea is that we can deliver these pheromones in, a in just a plethora of different ways to do it. And again, I've already given you the advantages, so let me go here. So we started a project called the Randall Island Project. It's a region in, in California where five growers came together. They risked, again, somewhere between two and ten million dollars. I never knew the exact amount. It depends on how mad they were at, at the moment or, or how nervous they were. And we got these guys together and we said, what would happen if we took and covered everything in pheromone? And it, they had to pay a quarter million dollars of their own money, more or less, to make this project happen. So people talk about growers being conservative. Here are five guys, fairly large growers, that are stepping up in a real serious way. Um, it turned out we were able to replicate this process. This is five different sites we did this on. Ultimately, we did it on 23, all the way from uh, California to, or to Washington. I had great partners. There's this um, at Washington State, Oregon State, U.S. Department of Agriculture. It's totally a collective effort, but we're down in California. So the bottom line here in this slide, you don't need to worry about it too much other than this one statement, is that the damage levels were great and they went down over time. They were down to the, uh, about a tenth of a percent of the fruit was damaged. The Randall Island Project, which is on the right in California, it was in 1998. I think I found six infested fruit out of some extraordinary number. I should have quit then. But it was just, we had great damage suppression. But more importantly, insecticide use went down about 75%. So the ones on the right where you see them sort of flatline at one spray per year, a normal grower and the, these fields the year before had four. So we cut it by about 75%. This is not an organic program. It's organically approved, but it doesn't work completely. It takes about 75% or so of the insecticide use out for this moth. So I've had friends criticize me. They said it's not 100%. And I decided that I would rather be effective than morally superior. So we went with this approach, which I think is mitigating insecticide use. It's not an alternative. Now I'm going to show you two more slides, and I'll call it quits. This is the best graphic I've got for the night, and then we'll call it. This is a site up in Washington. If you look on the left, what you see is red spots, white spots, and a few blue spots. Blue spots have zero damage. Red spots are the worst. You go one year later, after the introduction of the program, Two things are happening there. You have more, more people participating in the projects because I can tell you the most challenging part was getting people to participate because we're talking about tying little garbage twist ties in their trees and telling them not to spray and that was not a very convincing argument. So by, by the next year, 1997, it's like the entire region is letting a breath out. We're getting down to 0% damage and by 1998, the guys on the outside of the project are joining it. There's a collective uh, suppression of these moths that we found almost universally. My friends up in Washington State now no longer do research very often where they actually have to have damage because they can't find them. They can't find, they're not eradicated, they're there. Their just damage is so low now 
that it's, it's been um, implemented pretty fully. And with that, adoption's higher than this now. We're probably in the, around the range of 60, 70 percent. Um, this is an old slide, 2001. By 2011, the area I used to work in, I have all but one pair of grower is adopted it. It's cost effective. It works. And with that, I'm going to let, uh, let it go. And I appreciate your leniency. Okay. Anyway, thank you so much. So to start things off, I'd like to ask you a question. You talked about one type of biocontrol. Will, this, will these pheromones work for everything? Is this the magic bullet that's needed? Or do we need other approaches too? The answer is only yes if you're a funding agency. But, 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 the, but the answer is, of course not. So pheromones have only been really effective at a large commercial scale for about 10 insects. So those were moths. Um, other insects don't have the same kind of pheromones. It's difficult to make them work. I, I can go through other kinds of approaches that all have challenges. Sometimes they have huge advantages. I had more slides to bewilder you with. But the truth is, these things are challenging. They took probably 15, 20 years to make work. Um, when they work, they work really well. But it's not something that you can just, it's not a turnkey step in and move. Now, there are more and more types that are being looked at. There's companies that are springing up that are selling these. Um, there's a commercialization process that's gone on. And with commercialization, you have a much greater uh, likelihood of adoption because now you have another group that's carrying your flag. So it's definitely, first of all, it's not a silver bullet anyway because, again, you only reduced it by 75%. But secondly, it's not applicable to everything. With your background educationally and your experience in research, what's your, your best guess as to any long-term uh, effects that these, this new spray might have or, or might not have? How long has it been researched in terms of negative effects and what are the possibilities? Yeah, so the, first that's a, great, that's a great question because so many times we think there won't be an effect um, when in fact there, there can be. And this has been true for some pesticides as well that we could talk about. That is, is how do you test for things you don't know about yet? And that's very challenging. So to answer your question more directly, we're not aware of any yet. What I think will happen ultimately is that the insects themselves will become resistant to this program somehow. There's some evidence out of Japan that there's one insect that may have done that by changing the blend slightly. It's hard for them because if, if a female changes her blend, then the males got to still respond to it. But it turns out males are pretty open to a lot of blends. Anything that's even <laughs> anything kind of close, we're good with, right? So th there, there's probably that's going to happen. Um, this is a non as a non-native insect. It's an exotic that is actually imported. So it's a slightly different issue than if you were playing with a native insect. There's no native insects that we're aware of that are affected by it because the effect of this pheromone doesn't travel we think for 10 miles or something. It does bleed out of orchards, but there's no, or there's no insect that we're aware of that it would cause problems with. The nice part is a lot of these things, they also, they dissipate and then they're removed from either the orchards or that the unit is taken out. So there is some issues with plastic sometimes. So there is an accumulation of plastic if we aren't careful. And then you've got to come down to deciding, do I want plastic accumulation or do I want pesticides? And then the real question that I didn't really get to is who's the risk are we avoiding? For farm workers, I can tell you there's no, there's no decision. They will take this program all day, every day, because they don't have any exposure to the toxic materials. They don't harvest the fruit. They don't lay in the trees. They don't do that kind of thing. So th as far as we know, there's, there's no known risk yet. It's still controversial with the public. People are afraid of things like this sometimes. And, and the, the media can whip it up. But there's really, as far as I know, there's not, a, there's not an issue yet. But it's something we should be vigilant for. Because I think they would have said that about DDT. I was curious about your uh, view of genetically modified crops, which there are some documentaries running around saying it's the worst thing since I don't know what. Um, so I'd just like you to speak to that a little bit. Sure. So again, I'm not a molecular biologist. I, I'm not involved with this discipline. Um, 
So I'll, let me deal with the one that deals with in, the insecticidal nature of transformed crops. So as you guys probably know, they've been able to take a, a gene from a bacteria and they put it into corn or soybean or a variety. And they can get it to express that bacterial toxin and my sense of the data is it's very effective. And that as a consequence, insecticide use has gone down for those. Um, my initial concern, so there was concern at the beginning that it wasn't adequately tested um, with the monarchs. Um, it doesn't seem to be a problem. But the fact that they didn't have the data readily available, I think, was a problem. It just didn't bear out yet. Now, of the products that I'm aware of so far that are on the market, they don't seem to pose the risk that I think people, that at least I'm not concerned about. There doesn't seem to be the health issues. There doesn't seem to be the accumulation issues. Um, but having said that, they're only limited by their imagination. You know, so that we're, we're crossing some very interesting barriers now between species that normally couldn't have been crossed. You can put jellyfish genes into mice or monkeys or whatever, or into all kinds of organisms. Last time I checked, except for on the internet, you just never see that kind of thing happening, right, where they're romancing each other. So plants have been restricted by their, their reproductive capacity, but we're, we've moved past it. So as far as an insecticide output in cotton, I think it's been very positive. Um, there are other things that I think, the thing that bothered me was that the scale of adoption was so fast and so big that in the end, we tested on a, on a national level so quickly that it, may, it makes me still a little nervous. I hope there's not an issue. It's like the gentleman referred to as, it's the unknown that makes me fearful, but not so fearful as I would ever stop it. I also think that there are all kinds of things that people can do. Drought-resistant cassava would be such a wonderful opportunity in Africa where, and they're working on those. There are things that they could do that I think most people would go, that's pretty good. And then they have other things where someone just profits and then the question is, is do we want to take that risk in exchange for their profit? So there, there's different kinds of issues for different kinds of products. Do, does that make sense? But, but Steve, I, I think if, if you can summarize the three main concerns with GMOs, one is that they will move from one species to another, and so they will spread in ways that we can't control. One is that because you're providing new changes, you may have new allergies. If you moved a peanut gene yep. into apples, people yep. who are sensitive to peanuts could have a response. And the third is that there may be just these unknown, complicated, nasty things that happen causing cancer and so on. And I think probably that's, the, that's what's hit the news most recently in California, largely related to the French study. And, and I guess the, the one comment there is that in science, we have to have reproduction of studies before we believe them. And there are a, a lot of studies that are not necessarily valid, but get published in a, a key source. Right, right. So let, let me take off a little bit of what he said. So for instance, can you get, it's called integration, can you get gene flow from a, a crop into a native uh, host? The answer is yes. They've documented it for sunflowers, for instance. It turns out they didn't release the sunflower, modified sunflower, because the rate of genetic flow from agricultural sunflowers into wild sunflowers is quite high. So they shut it down. So, but they developed it. So if they had deployed it, would it have been a mistake? Absolutely. Um, but they didn't. So there, there needs to be a, clearly a regulatory oversight on that. And uh, the issues of peanuts have been around for quite a while. As far as I know, it hasn't expressed itself yet. There was the recent French study that challenged the health effects. People have criticized that paper, but this is the part I like, and, and this is my bias. I like the fact that science can be wrong. I like the fact that scientists challenge each other, and you can make a name sometimes. Just If I could just prove an idea of Stanley's, it's almost as good as having my own idea. So what happens then is the, the clash of ideas is ultimately what I have faith in. And so that there will be people who challenge the safety of something, and then there'll be people who will come back and look at those studies. And so as long as we have an open process for the scientific review, I, I feel pretty good. If that review process gets stepped on or is biased or is controlled financially, then we have a problem. But I, I guess maybe I'm naive, but I, I have pretty good faith in that. 
Okay, I'm reverting back to the subject of pheromones really quickly. I just had a question. You mentioned momentarily that the cost um, seems to be a bit high. So how are they actually produced? Are they synthetically produced? And how can you decrease that cost to make it a viable option? Oh, that's a great question because I have the answer. Um, <laughs> they're produced synthetically. They have um, uh, uh, different processes. They, they patent the process. They have manufacturing plants that do the same thing. Um, so, so for instance, we, we're working on this year, in fact, and last year, where we've been able to cut the amount of pheromone at least by half. Um, we think we can reduce the number of units. We have a very different way of deploying it now that reduces the cost again by about half. And then we did a study this year where it turns out we only have to release it at certain times of days. Rather than release it 24 hours or 12 hours, we've got it down to what we think is maybe six or seven, which again cuts the cost of the pheromone down a lot. So I think what's happening is the more we look, first we were asking the question is, can we make this work and work reliably so that the growers could accept it as a reliable, and now we're at the stage where we're saying is, how do we push it down and make it more cost effective? My dream, if that's what it is, and I believe it's a soon to be realized dream, is it will be less expensive than insecticides. And so I, I tease the growers and that I'll tell them, I said, if you're not using it, you're not a good businessman. And they, of course, roll their eyes. But in the end, we, we're having good adoption, and we definitely are moving into a very economic region. I think we could actually make it less expensive. Now, whether or not the companies will set that as a price point is a different question, because then, then they're looking at competitive products. But it, it can definitely be done. People play with patent, by the way. They also play with um, synthetic pathways and looking at better ways to produce it less effect, uh, more efficiently. So one of the things that you mentioned is that we really need insecticides. And I, I think that perspective may be different when you look at developing countries versus the US and the impact of insecticides on agriculture in those countries. For example, let's, let's take India. <coughs> Could you say something about that? About India? Sure. It, well, about developing countries anywhere. Well, what is, what is true for our agriculture it is laden with assumptions, right? We, we've made the decision, again, for a highly productive, very reliable, um, low human input kind of system. In developing countries, that's not the case. Labor is less, much less expensive. Uh, inputs are much lower. They can't afford it. Things that they can do or, or would opt to do are very different. So insecticides as a, as a cost is so different for them than it is for us as well. There also can be issues of safety that are different between here and there. You know, so sometimes you'll see people who will say, I want um, certain regulations here, but those same regulations aren't expressed in another country. So what they're doing is they're offloading their risk. They're offloading, really in a funny way, they're, they're uh, I'm not sure what the word is, but they're, their values are not being offloaded to the country because when you buy the, the product from another country that doesn't have to follow the same rules and someone else is put at risk, but you buy the fruit risk-free, is very different. You've detached the, the connection. And, I, and so I think that when people talk about sustainable agriculture, what they talk about is alternative methods that can be deployed here, fine. But they often are easier to deploy in developing countries because they have such a different structural system for their food production. Uh, I'm wondering if the, if the pheromones are synthetically produced, is there a meaningful difference between uh, the pheromone and a safe pesticide? Well, and is a safe pesticide non-synthetic? No, I don't know. I'm, or even if it's, let's just leave this synthetically produced part out and say, is the, is the use of pheromones uh, different than the use of pesticides in a meaningful way? Uh, if we have a safe pesticide, a, a safe pheromone, it does that matter? So as a person, I'd say no. So do I like, there's a lot of different names, biorationals, there's all different groups of pesticides. Um, you can buy them that are organically approved, they're short residuals, they're very effective, they're very selective, they're very uh, limited in their target effects. Uh, BT is a classic. Um, do I think they have value? Great. Is there anything intrinsically superior to a pheromone versus that? No. There are other approaches that I think have an intrinsic superiority where if you use natural enemies, where you have a self-sustaining process by which predators regulate prey. 
that I think has intrinsic value because it's a sustainable in a very different way, whereas pheromones are a reapplied system. An insecticide can be reapplied as well. well. I'd like to know what specifically occurs between commercially raised, um, particularly fruits, not so much vegetables, and um, you know, wild berries. Um, for instance, some um, years ago when I was a child, my sisters and I in our neighborhood, we had this open field and there'd be these wild strawberries and they were a deep red and you could smell them and you'd bite into them and they're sweet. And commercially produced um, strawberries are much bigger and they have no taste to them and they're hard. But um, the ones my sisters and I used to pick, they're about, at the largest I'd say was about the size of, um, I'd say probably a shooter, the big type of marble, but they're usually, but they're really good. My guess would be is if we all thought back to our childhood, we'd have the same conversation where we all remember something that tasted a lot better than what it's tasting like now. And, and I, I can't tell you I know the answer specifically what's happened other than when you select on something, when a, a breeder selects on something, other traits start to give even if you don't know what they are. And I, I've done a lot of research on crop domestication and we don't have time to go into it here and it gets a little, it gets a little wonky. But what happens is that when you're trying to just maximize yield, you accidentally give up other things. So the flavor in the tomato, for instance, one, they didn't mean to get, they didn't say, we should have a flavorless tomato, that'd be great. What they did is they said, I want a big red tomato that gets great yields and it's high solid and all those kinds of things. And, and somewhere along the line, taste was given up. They didn't select for taste, and in doing so, they lost that property sometimes. I think that's true for a lot of things, like strawberries, where you can get those little tiny deep red berries that have just tremendous flavor, but can you get that same flavor in the very large chocolate dipped, um, which is how we give it the flavor, um, <laughs> strawberry that you'll, you'll see commercially sold. And, and like I mentioned, these were wild strawberries yeah. that just grew up, but they were just grown in an open field. Right. And the raspberries were the same way. Right. So. Our, 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 our modern strawberry, by the way, is, is a hybrid across a couple of uh, types, and it's now an octoploid. It has eight times the number of uh, genes, so it's, a, it's an interesting organism. Yes, sir. Uh, good evening. Thanks for coming and sharing your time. Uh, my, my question is back to, I guess, the risk and the challenge for me as a non-scientist yeah. is what to believe. And so my question is, who do you believe as far as where risk is on, you know, whether the GMO or a pesticide or how it applies to the public and how do we then educate the public? Because there's so many different studies and information and, and where do we go to get, you know, a consensus? I mean, that's a great, I don't really know if I know the answer. So. Um, I guess as I've gotten older, my answer changed a little bit. So, for instance, I never bought organic fruit for my kids. Maybe that said something. But in the end, I didn't, because I didn't believe it was much of a risk. Um, there's new data that makes me a little more concerned on endocrine disruption. I'm not sure that it wouldn't have been a good decision to avoid the risk and pay a little bit more. Even though it's probably fairly small, to be honest, so, so, but I, but I certainly were not starving to death as a family, so we could have afforded that. Um, I find I look at the literature, but as a scientist, and so I, I start to get an aggregate data set. I guess I still am old enough that I still believe the government, which maybe isn't such a good thing, but I do believe that the people that I know in the EPA are, are for the most part, very good people. They're not there, they're not really corporate wonks. And so I do believe that they try their very best to review things in the way that they can. And recognizing they're embedded in a political matrix, I still have faith in the process. Um, I don't know who else to have faith in. But I will say I will err now more on the side of not having faith um, because it's easy. I mean, it's safer is a better way to put it. It's not easier, it's safer. So um, that's, what I, that's what I find I still tend to do. But anyone, anyone else's answer it could be is just as valid as mine. One last question. I suppose my question sort of feeds into the last one. Um, as a student in biology, I know that reading through scientific papers is a lot of work. And um, I think there's a lot of mediation between the public and the researchers that is lost. Um, 
And I'm wondering if there's any work being done to sort of make scientific papers more readable to the public and to sort of bridge the gap between the media, which gives a very biased view of scientific papers and the scientific papers themselves. So there are, there are some science publications that are quite accessible, actually. They're written for a slightly different audience. And oftentimes, even journals like Science will have articles that are something that we could read and, and be very comfortable with them. And so there are those sort of digest. There's a lot of articles in science I can't read and have no interest in reading. Um, so there are things that you can, I, I think you can get, discover magazines, those kinds of things that are fairly accessible, but it's hard to know how to translate the really wonky papers down to a level that's, I don't think we need to get to that level. I think we need the larger, more summarized kinds of papers to be made accessible. Do you buy that? <laughs> So if I could make one last question. I think part of the problem here is that there is a certain period in science where you just don't know. I mean, you may be trying to disprove my idea while I'm trying to disprove your idea. And toll it's, it's gone through a, a lot of work. The scientists themselves don't really know. And so when you're in the public and you hear so-and-so prove this and so-and-so prove this, you feel like a ping pong ball. and and. And the reason is because at that time, there is no answer. It, it's in a state of transition. And I think that's, that's the big problem that exists here. So uh, uh, let me, let me f I'm going to get the last word. Um, <laughs> the thing I like about science is that we don't tell the truth with a capital T. We tell truth with a small t. And the reason why is because truth changes all the time. And that as new facts emerges, emerge, our perspective changes. Um, I have a friend who is in an intense battle with a company right now <coughs> over the effect of a compound's effect on our hormonal system. I think in the end of the day, I'm guessing he's going to be right, but he's only going to win through the literature and other people validating his studies. So <coughs> in this interim time period, um, he, he hasn't been able to get his point accepted yet. So we're going, to be a, we're going to maybe be at risk for a little while here. But in the end of the day, I guess I have faith that we will march forward to the right answer. Um, but we will, we will go back, back and forth on it. So to me, I, I guess, again, I end up with the, the faith in the process. I, I know my partners. I know the things we do. We certainly make mistakes. Most of the guys I know are very ethical. And it's that struggle. The struggle is what I believe in, and that you can, you can have ideas get crushed very heavily and tested very heavily through our peer review process. Um, and so it may take a while, but I do have faith. You didn't get the last word, because Michael gets to have the last word. <laughs> I was so close. <laughs> Maybe I should skip the last words. I mean, so this was an outstanding beginning for the Silent Spring series. I, I think this was just what we needed for the program. Um, I have a couple of closing announcements. Before I get to those, I want to thank both Stan Malloy as our moderator this evening and Steve Walter. <laughs> and I certainly want to thank those of you in the audience who had the guts to get up and ask some questions that I'm sure all of you had. You're all welcome, of course, to come up and talk further after the close of the program. And I hope you'll all continue those conversations later. Um, as you know, this is, this is uh, a series, and this is only the first of six programs in the series. And the, some of the points that came up today are perfect segues into the next program, which will be led by somebody by the name of Mitchell Tomashow. He's not from San Diego. He's coming here. He um, was the head of an environmental studies program for 30 years at Antioch University. Um, he was uh, president of Unity College back east. And he's been very interested in environmental issues, and particularly the story of Rachel Carson. So he's going to talk about what we can learn from Rachel Carson about, I think, some of those very points that came up tonight about how to find consensus, how to find the wisdom we need to negotiate these complex stories. And some of them might be answered by, I think, alluded to education here at the end, that people need to understand, for example, how science works better. Some of them might come from legislation. Some of them might come from regulation. But where those might come from is part of what we want to try and address in, this, in the remainder of the series. So please join us. Now, that next program is December. 
We will not be meeting in November, at least at, as of this point, we're not planning any program in November. So you are welcome to sign up now for that December program. And finally, before closing, I definitely have to thank UCSD TV again for recording tonight's program, thank the Fleet Science Center for hosting us here, and San Diego State University for providing support for tonight's program. So thank you again to everybody. Thank you.